Well, welcome to this edition of the Scott Ritter Show. Um, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're at. Um, it's been a it's been an interesting week. Um, we've been told that the Russian mobilization, partial mobilization, is complete. Uh, that all 300,000 of the uh, troops called up have been received. Um, around 87,000 of them have been deployed to the um, theater of the special military operation. Others have been deployed elsewhere. Uh, others are finalizing their um, consolidation into combat units. Um, what does this mean? Now that Russia has completed the, uh, the, the partial mobilization, what's next? Is Russia going to be satisfied with simply further consolidating their defenses? Uh, will Russia expand its offensive operations uh, to complete the liberation of the uh, Donbass of uh, the Donetsk region? Will Russia expand this? Uh, this, the scope and scale of the special military operation to um, make a move on Odessa to create a linkage with Syria. Um, what 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 is can Russia do this? Is Russia capable of doing this? Does Russia want to do this? Um, in the face of that, we're we're looking at um, some important actions on the part of the Ukrainians. Uh, we see the Ukrainians carrying out a, a underwater drone attack um, on. The Russian fleet in Sevastopol. Um, it's a bold attack. Uh, it may not have achieved uh, all of the damage that the Ukrainians wanted, but it was one heck of a political statement. Um, and there were consequences because, in order to carry out this attack, uh, Ukraine used the uh, shipping lanes that had been demilitarized under an agreement with the United Nations uh, so that food shipments could be transported out of Ukraine to uh, the rest of the world. And, hopefully, and uh, to the developing part of the world where there's a risk of great hunger. Um, we also found out that the British probably played a role in this attack. Not just this, uh, there's information that suggests that Britain played a role in the, um, the attack on the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 pipelines. Uh, Britain is a NATO member. Uh, Russia has said there will be consequences. What are the potential of a direct Russian-British um, confrontation, military confrontation, and um, how could that manifest itself on this, this the overall military situation? Uh, there's a lot going on, and uh, I think there's no better person to talk about this than uh, today's guest, uh, Alexei Leonkov. He is a um, established military expert, military analyst, and um, Alexei, I welcome you to the uh, to, to the show. Здравствуйте, uh, Скотт. Hello, Scott. Um, first question. Uh, we'll, we'll start off with the with the attack on uh, the on Sevastopol. Um, what are the consequences going to be for for the British? I mean, they've engaged in an overt act of war against Russia, uh, but there are consequences if Russia attacks a NATO member. But Russia has promised consequences. What sort of um, consequences could we be talking about? Well, if we're talking about uh, the attempt to attack uh, the Sevastopol uh, fleet and the base where they were located, what Russia has promised, that there will be consequences. We, we need to understand this, that these consequences can be symmetrical and, um, and asymmetrical as well. Russia has taken a, a certain pause, which Peskov has mentioned, to uh, collect all the evidence to, um, to respond correctly. I don't think we can expect radical, uh, radical answers, as some specialists uh, are mentioning. Uh, Russia will not respond uh, militarily and directly, because these are very sensitive issues, and of course this is very sensitive uh, for Great Britain. But when, when this response will happen, we will leave that decision to, um, to the commander. And when, when that decision will be made, then, then the action will be taken. Thank you for that. Um, New York Times had a story uh, just the other day that talked about Ukraine achieving artillery supremacy over Russia in the Kherson uh, region, saying that because Ukraine had been provided with 
advanced artillery systems by the United States, Germany, and others, uh, that they were able to outrange uh, comparable Russian systems and achieve uh, some sort of dominance on the battlefield. Um, is this the case? Do you believe that the Ukrainians have, in fact, achieved artillery supremacy over Russia in the Kherson uh, front? Well, um, when we talk about the supremacy, we need to study it closely. But at um, uh, certain points um, about uh, advanced artillery is uh, attacking at certain points, and attacking such points in, in Kherson region is the Antonovsky Bridge, um, and it's been shelled uh, with HIMARS systems and using uh, far hitting. 155 uh, self-prepared artillery units and Excalibur units and when these when this shelling is happening uh, this kind of tactics and changing the position uh, they move very quickly and in time uh, these systems do uh, are able to not get noticed and targeted by Russians but uh, reconnaissance from the Russian side is, is, does take place, and recently we, it's been reported by the Ministry of Defense that uh, Russia did mention that recently they've destroyed three of those uh, systems, uh, two HIMARS systems and one Mars 2 system. It's a German analog of the American MLRs. But um, we've also been told that uh, Caesar and M109 has also been damaged uh, during counter battery fire. So when we talk about advantages and we talk about uh, en masse, it's, it doesn't, ex doesn't happen. But these sort of attacks, they are. Uh, they are also counterattacked from the Russian side, and the Ukrainian artillery doesn't always have the ability to uh, to move away in time, and they do get hit as well in the Kherson region. Th again, thanks, thanks for that. Um, one of the, the big surprises of this conflict so far has been the um, the role played by um, the Geranium II drone. Um, whether you want to say it's a Russian-made drone or you want to say it's a, from Iran, that's a political question. The reality is there's a drone on the battlefield called the Geranium II. Uh, it's a loitering munition uh, that, that is capable of striking, and it's had a tremendous impact on the, uh, on the conflict. Uh, the implication there is that Russia was unprepared for this new reality of drone warfare, that Russia had its own drone capabilities, but those capabilities were not sufficient for the reality of the conflict they found in Ukraine, so they had to turn elsewhere. Um, is Russia prepared to fight and win this new drone uh, war? Uh, are they going to make use of additional Iranian or additional models of drones? Uh, what's the future hold for drone warfare? in the uh, special military operation zone of operation. Um, it's true that SMO, um, we see a lot of use of um, unmanned aerial vehicles in, in this conflict, and it's all types of um, UAVs are used in this conflict. Reconnaissance, um, Loitering munitions and uh, Duran 2 is, is exactly that. And when this conflict has started, we thought that um, both sides will have a number of UAVs, but the effectiveness of the air defense systems. So, um, decisions would have to be made and to adapt, and there were times there were hundreds of UAVs um, doing, uh, different, uh, doing different tasks. So in, in case of Russia, these complexes of um, air defense systems that Russia has, um, Russia has definitely an advantage in that sense, and they're effectively uh, able to hit all the Ukrainians' uh, UAVs. However, in, in case of Ukraine, 
Ukraine. Ukraine does not uh, have enough air defense systems to battle the Russians. So the systems that they started receiving uh, from NATO countries, they turned out to be ineffective uh, in this in this warfare. And Jurantsu, which are made from composite materials, and therefore they fly on hypersonic speed almost, and they become the rulers of the sky, if you say, and they use uh, different tactics, and they, they try to stop these attacks. Um, Ukraine is trying to stop these attacks using old Soviet equipment and um, just machine gun fire. So the remaining uh, air defense systems, they are being sacrificed and um, Ukrainian UAVs are taken from, from very far distances, uh, taken out the Ukrainian drones. So the Chirantu at the moment is definitely a, a great example that's um, in pointing out the deficiencies in the uh, air defense systems in Ukraine, and perhaps they weren't, um, they were misjudged, that there is no, no countering them at the moment, or there is no clear way of countering them. Um, so IRST, uh, SLM, SM systems have, have not shown their effectiveness against these uh, kind of drones. And they have not shown effective work uh, against um, against Russian rockets that are flying all over the sky, like Iskander missiles, that are high precision and uh, hitting those um, critical infrastructure points in Ukraine. Let's, let's talk about that for a second, the critical infrastructure points. Um, this is sort of a new phenomenon that took place shortly after um, General uh, Surovokin has uh, took over, um, and it appears to have been very effective. Uh, the Ukrainian uh, power grid is is shutting down in many locations, um, but the Ukrainians have shown resilience, the ability to reconstitute um, this this power grid. Is this something that Russia is doing to prove a point, or is this something that Russia is going to sustain until the bitter end? Is Russia you know, winter is coming? Um, People need power. Is Russia going to deny the Ukrainian population, the Ukrainian military leadership, uh, the political leadership, access to power? Or has Russia made its point, and now are they going to let up and let uh, Ukrainians have a, a more humane winter? Well, if, if we're talking about critical infrastructure, we need to understand that um, from the start of the SMO, that these, these, um, these strikes and challenges did take place already, but they were more military objects, uh, military targets, where um, military equipment was transported, so it was those points where it was stored, and it was um, taken on the railroads. So now we can say that um, a fair amount of damage has been done at sort of logistical points as well. So um, um, they, would, they would limit the amount of equipment and that would have an effect on SMO. However, uh, new, new routes were, were developed by Ukraine, so um, Ministry of Defense and the Russian headquarters have decided to, decide, uh, decided to, to conduct another operation that would target the energy system of Ukraine that... Um, that all these logistical um, logistical points uh, rely on. That's why they're hitting all these uh, electric uh, electricity targets and so forth. And they have uh, substations, and these stations may be purely used for, for lights and heating of, um, of the cities, so, so we're taking 50, 60 kilowatts. 
So the Ukrainian government is now forced to to make a to make a difficult decision whether they need to remain those cities with with heating and lighting, or use that electrical energy and use that energy to uh, to those logistical points and supply it there to help um, and direct it to the front lines. So this critical infrastructure strikes. That's what they have done. Okay, thank you. Uh, in, in the United States, we have news reports of uh, American troops on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, they're not combat troops, per se. They're what we call on-site inspection teams that are there to do an inventory of the equipment that has been provided to Ukraine to make sure that it was used properly and not resold on the black market. Um, are these troops at risk? Uh, you know, is Russia going to seek to target these troops? Do Americans have to worry about um, American troops dying um, on the ground in Ukraine? And um, would I mean, is Russia willing to accept? <laughs> Yes, risk. There, there is a risk of that, unfortunately, for for any um, for any troops that are in Ukraine and near the SMR. So former or current that are there in uh, in the uh, theater, and there have been people that have been killed by the Russians, and they even showed the documents. So, if those inspectors are there to to check the amount of ammunition or amount of weaponry that is there, they need to understand that if, if they're even far from, uh, from the fighting, but if they will be closer, that there is no guarantees that they could be they could be shelled from from the Russian side which are very accurately uh, trying to track any movements of the of the equipment whether they're in BTRs or any any armored vehicles um, we understand that there could be Ukrainians there or there could be uh, private military uh, forces there so they are indeed can be targeted okay thanks we, we take a look at the potential of um, expanding this conflict, and there, there's a couple areas that jump out. Uh, one is uh, the Transnistria region, 400,000 uh, people who have declared their independence from Moldova and expressed um, you know, a, a, a sense of loyalty to Russia. Uh, they're in an exposed position right now. Um, what would Russia do if uh, Moldova made a move on Transnistria? Would Russia respond militarily? Um, is Russia going to solve this problem once and forever by uh, creating a land bridge between uh, Kherson and Transnistria? Uh, what's the future of Odessa, in your opinion? Well, the main operative, uh, operative and tactical uh, goal is to, uh, for Russia to free those territories, uh, Lugansk, Donetsk, republics which, which have joined Russia recently. Of course, we understand that uh, we're talking about um, the line needs to be pushed further. As um, weaponry, the NATO weaponry is hitting those cities and civilian targets. For example, HIMARS, um, GMLRS rockets are used and they fly on 130, 150 kilometers. So you can have a look on the map and they need to draw out those lines to where uh, Russian, Russian troops would need to be moved. But this zone is, obviously Nikolaev is in that zone and of course um, Russian troops, if Russian troops would, would move to Nikolaev and of course we need to 
presume that Russia would do the same in those territories which it already liberated. Of course, it would be helping the civilian population restoring infrastructure. But of course, we understand that uh, Ukrainian army will try and prevent this, so Russian military will need to keep moving and it's possibly it will move up to Transnistria and even up to Moldova. So it all will depend on how Moldova will react and how it will act. If it will remain neutral, uh, then there will be no fear for, for Russian attack, but Russia will carry on um, committing uh, and be committed to the to fulfilling those goals that are set and um, will, will fulfill the intensification and demilitarization and it will be and the special military operation will go on until until that is done. Now when you, you mentioned denazification and um, implicit in that uh, when I hear denazification um, I hear Stepan Bandera. I hear the about the Banderist ideology um, and I think of Lvov and I think of statues that are erected to this uh, this character um, I think of his elevation to status of a national hero in Ukraine um, and I think of a population in Western Ukraine that actually has embraced his ideology um, and they believe in it what does denazification mean when it comes to Stepan Bandera his memory, his statues, the people who uh, worship him. Um, what's going to happen to them? Um, can there be not denazification so long as places like Lvov continue to put up monuments to this, this hateful character and continue to elevate him to the status of hero? Or does he need to be completely eradicated? Uh, you know, in um, 1955, when um, when Nikita Khrushchev has released uh, from prison the uh, Bandarites that were taking part and members of the UPA, it would uh, lead that those uh, teachings of Stepan Bandera, which is very similar to the teachings to, of, of Nazis and has the same symbolism, that it would, it would stop, stop existing because people would want to live a nicer life, but unfortunately this did not happen. What happened is that a rebirth, a birth of neo-Nazism, and it has taken such characterizations that, that uh, show Nazism, fascism, and near religious and turn into near religious cults. And our president has called it Satanism because what goes on there. Um, all these teachings, they, only those members that are Banderites, they, they will not accept anyone who is not part of that. And those are part of that sect. Um, they consider those who are not. They, they need to be destroyed. So when freeing these territories and liberating all this heritage, um, all these um, monuments, they need to be destroyed, of course. And of course, with the, with the population, certain work needs to be conducted, so they, need to un they would understand what kind of a trap uh, they were forced into. So in the future, this kind of, birth of rebirth of neo-Nazism in Ukraine would never take place again. Thank you again for that for that answer. Um, Russia has deployed tens of thousands of troops, by some counts, uh, 60, 70, maybe even 80,000 troops into Belarus uh, to form an operational group. And it appears that uh, it's gonna be a unified operational group <laughs> with the uh, Belarus military. Um, what's the purpose of this force? Is it to defend Belarus? Is it to potentially threaten Kiev? Is it to serve as a rapid reaction force in case Poland seeks to move into Western Ukraine? Can we expect that Belarus is going to become a combatant in the special military operation sometime in the future? Well, you know, the contingent that is, that is in, in Belarus, it actually 
is about 9,000. So, of course, the total number, if we talk about the Belarusian army as well, um, they have this similar military education, and um, in Belarusian military is about 75,000 there that is on the border. But the contingent that is uh, in Belarus from Russian side is to help the Belarusian army in case there is an aggression, for example, from the side of Ukraine, and God forbid, from uh, Poland or uh, from Baltic states. So we need to understand that those um, that those there are the present in Belarus, they're they are helping and to. Uh, to cover those those forces that maybe there are not there in Belarus at the moment, uh, for example, uh, rocketry uh, units or uh, nuclear weapons. So to say, to prevent this co concert, um, conflict from becoming, uh, you know, local. So even this scenario is, is taken into account in case this conflict gets out of hand. So uh, the coordination uh, between uh, uh, the troops and um, to protect this uh, Russian, uh, sorry, Ukrainian Belarus border, to avoid provocations from, from Ukraine. And, and prevent the conflict from happening on the border and anything that may happen. And as we can see in the news, the provocations have already started. Um, of course, part of them are just on the informational field, but but some of them actually do happen on the ground and, and near the uh, Belarus-Ukraine border. Thank you for that. Speaking of provocations, um, the news has been abuzz with the uh, presence of a brigade from the American 101st Airborne Division deployed to Romania and uh, carrying out uh, joint military drills with the Romanian uh, armed forces um, very close to the uh, Romanian border with Ukraine. There's a lot of speculation um, in the American media about what these troops could be used for. Are they there purely for deterrence? Or could they be used uh, to deploy into Ukraine, uh, for instance, to protect Odessa from being attacked by Russia to help Poland secure uh, Western Ukraine? What's the Russian perspective about these forces? How does Russia view uh, the 101st Airborne and uh, its potential uh, going forward, special military operation? No, it's not yet. No. Well, you know, the 101st uh, um, Airborne, which, which appeared in Romania, is considered uh, it's already considered as, as a part of, of those units that were already there. So, so 101st can, can um, dis dislocate their, their units anywhere in the world. So we, we, we treat it adequately. And we understand that there will be no direct confrontation well, between U.S. and Russia. And U.S. is trying to avoid it now, as 101st would, would be considered by Russia as a target. As we have said many times, and Russia has mentioned many times, that uh, any well foreign equipment, uh, foreign troops, even private military companies, they could be currently serving or former. Um, they are they are targets on the territory of the special military operation, and Russia has never never hidden that. So, um, 101st being on Ukrainian territory would, would lead to something which we do not want. That would lead to um, U.S. Um, having to take very difficult decisions. As everyone understands, if the conflict of two great powers, if it was to take place, it, it, it would not limit itself to using non-nuclear weapons. It would lead to a global uh, catastrophe um, and a huge conflict. And I think in Pentagon, uh, people understand that. So, of course, the demonstration of this flag uh, that uh, 101st has shown in Romania, it's understandable. And therefore, U.S. is showing, uh, just showing how, how much they're supporting Ukraine in, in the conflict with Russia. But I don't think that um, after demonstration of this flag, there would be, um, there would not be any... Um, any direct uh, conflict of that 101st, and they would not go into the territory in Ukraine. 
Again, thank you for that. Um, another story that came out last week was of the dirty bomb. Uh, it made headline news around the world. Uh, telephone calls from uh, the, the Russian Minister of Defense, uh, Sergei Shoigu, to his counterparts in the West. Um, and it was based upon some intelligence information uh, that Russia had collected about a Ukrainian plot. Uh, I guess this is a two-part question. One, what's your understanding of the, um, the genuine character of this plot? Was it something that Russia had a whisper of? Or was this a real plot that was going to happen? Um, and then the second question is, what would Russia have done if Ukraine had carried out this plot? In the West, everybody says Russia would have used a nuclear weapon against Ukraine. Would Russia have responded with a nuclear weapon against Ukraine had the Ukrainians carried out a dirty bomb plot against themselves? Well, you know, Ukraine is, has been interested in nuclear weapons for a long time, and we have seen this not just during the special military operation, we have seen this in the past, and even um, Ukrainian politicians have mentioned this, and they have stated that Ukraine should have nuclear weapons. Um, Russian intelligence, before the special military operation has started, it has determined targets where uh, um, work related to nuclear weapons is taken. For example, where the utilization um, factory uh, scalpel, we have seen um, four, four rockets that were just needed to be um, needed to be ready for launching. So uh, appearance of uh, nuclear warheads in Ukraine, it, it it seemed like a like a technical operation which which could be conducted, but it wasn't clear uh, which state would would help them with that. So when we heard um, something about the dirty bomb, uh, everyone understands, so it's not a tactical nuclear warhead, it would be a bomb that would be something that uh, after, it, after it detonates, it would have to it'd be used to, um, to infect uh, all the um, areas with radiation. So it's not it's not an effective weapon that could be used against Russia, but we are alarmed by the fact that um, during the special nature operation they have received 10,000 uh, units of, of clothing, uh, which is used to protect from um, nuclear and biological elements and even have um, analysis of what um, what radioactive waste could be used against um, um, to detect whether it's um, used on uh, whether it's plain nuclear waste or if it's uh, waste from a tactical nuclear weapon so uh, use of a tactical nuclear weapon after which uh, an expert from the West could say perhaps with this uh, analysis could say oh this was a tactical nuclear weapon of unknown origin and there and therefore uh, for example uh, Iskander missile uh, could be used and uh, pieces of that nuclear uh, um, sorry pieces of that rocket could be scattered around but of course Russia has no plans of using tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine. And of course the uh, politics of, of using nuclear weapons uh, and the Russian military doctrine would not want, um, would not, would not be used in Ukraine. And the president has given guarantees that tactical nuclear weapons that would not be used on the territory of Ukraine. However, if it's, it would be used as a provocation and as a false flag, then, then this could be a difficult, um, a complicated construction which could be used um, against Russia. And Western mass media would, would pick this up and say that Russia has used this, this weapon somewhere in the city or in Kiev. So this is an unhumane act that supposedly Russia has done. And they would take it to UN General Assembly, etc., etc. So it's a, it's a kind of far 
far-reaching and far-fetching political consequences. And Ukraine needs to be responsible, and Russia is being responsible, that it would not use uh, nuclear weapons against a country which does not uh, possess such weapons. Thank you for that. The, um, you know, one of the perceptions here in the West is that Russia has overextended itself uh, in the special military operation. Um, and that the proof of this is the partial mobilization, that Russia was compelled to mobilize 300,000 troops just to stabilize the situation um, in Ukraine. And a spinoff of that is that this means that Russia is weaker in other areas, for instance, Syria. Um, that Russia is weak in the Caucasus, that Armenia and Az or the Azerbaijan might seek to take advantage of the perception of Russian weakness to, um, to, to gain advantage over Armenia because Russia would not be able to respond. Uh, Georgian nationalists are calling for uh, the Georgians to attack Abkhazia and South Ossetia because Russia will not be strong enough to respond. This is a chance for Georgia to uh, win back these territories. And there's even talk that uh, Japan could theoretically make a move against the Kuril Islands, the disputed islands, and that Russia would be too weak to respond. Is Russia too weak to respond to these threats? Has Russia uh, outstripped its capability to defend itself by putting all of its resources into the special military operation? Or is Russia fully capable of doing the special military operation and meeting all of its uh, requirements um, elsewhere? Well, even, even when the special military operation has started, this, um, this contingent that was there, it was dislocated in, in the sense that it would not weaken uh, any, any safety on, on, on the Russian borders. Uh, anywhere where Russian peacekeeping forces are there, or any, um, if it's uh, Syria or Caucasus, or Transistria, or military bases that are in Central Asia, everywhere where Russian military is present. But the main um, mobilization purpose was to um, be able to respond from, for, or to an attack from any region. Russia still has the capability to answer that. And before uh, mobilization, Russia has made a decision that our our troops that need to be reinforced by at least 137,000 um, that would serve on contract basis. And um, this would be a reaction to Sweden and Finland joining NATO. So when partial mobilization was announced, it was um, taken out of that uh, reserve that, that would be there. And this mobilization reserve is, uh, is about 25 million people. So partial mobilization has only touched on 300,000. So it's just uh, merely a 1% from the total number of reservists. Those people who have um, military experience, who have served in the military forces in the past, and it's exactly these people who were mobilized. These people have, have been prepared. Part of them is already on, on the front lines and all the types of forces that Russia has are always uh, ready for battle and ready to repel any any um, any danger that would be whether on the border or anywhere where Russian military is present and when well, Russian military and peacekeeping forces are present. Thank you for that. Um, one last question, and this is the big one, the million dollar question. If you and I were to get together one month from now, and um, how would you describe the situation on the ground in the special military operation? What what you project it to be one month from now? What what do you see happening between now and then? Is it going to be the same? Are there going to be major differences? Uh, what what what's your assessment? Well, I think that in a month's time. 
After all the mobilized troops would be uh, in the military theater, and they would be, they would join all the units and the battalions that are there on the front lines. The oldest line would start moving forward. I'm not saying about any major counteroffensives, but um, moving movements towards the west would be much more intensive, as in such a huge number of troops that are used in the SMO would allow the, the command to, to combine and try different different tactical tactical plays on, on different in different directions and this could be as, as offensive or as counter-offensive operations so we could say that um, a movable defense for uh, to say that would be able to to move the the front lines uh, to to the west and the result of this company, well, we would see, it we will be able to at least determine when the special military operation would be nearing uh, towards its end, or at least when most of the goals would be accomplished. At the moment, the key is to understand, uh, to move the front lines um, from the Kherson, Zaporozhye regions, Donetsk and Lugansk uh, republics to push those front lines past their borders. And at the moment, this, this is already um, slowly taking place. And 80,000, as you said, have already, have already there. And the remaining 220,000 are on the way. And when they get there, and of course they will get there with, uh, with all the military equipment that has been assessed and prepared, and changes will be all across, uh, all across the board. Of course it would not happen in one moment. This would, this would happen depending on the assessments of the commanders, and they would have to try and formulate better tactical moves to, to accomplish those, uh, those goals set out. Thank you very much. I want to thank you very much, Alexei Leonkov, for your valuable analysis. I think you've, uh, I know you've um, educated me, and hopefully you've educated the audience as well. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Um, this has been a, an informative uh, discussion. We've, I, I think, answered a lot of questions that I've been getting from various sources about what's going on in Ukraine. Um, and this is important because at the end of the day, knowledge is power. And uh, I believe this show helped bring knowledge to everybody. So thank you again for showing, uh, for showing up. It's been the Scott Ritter Show.